All right, all right, all right. Anybody ready for church? Yeah. Hey, before we even get started, if you're joining us online, we are so excited that you're here. Metro, would you guys welcome our online crowd? Come on. Yeah, we are really glad that you're here. Uh, that wasn't much of a welcome, but I tell you what, I'm glad that you're here. Church, welcome our friends. Okay, come on. Let's go. Come on. Hey, before we jump in this uh, too far, we need to uh, let you know something here. This young man, uh, Mr. Trent, uh, who is part of our worship team here, uh, he grew up in this church, and it's been so exciting for me to see this young man grow up. Uh, he and his wife just had their first baby this week. Yeah. So if you see him, uh, cheer him on. He's going to be such a great dad, uh, and uh, I'm just so proud of him. He's just a great young man. Uh, so uh, I am glad that you're here. And I hope uh, uh, that you're glad that you're here. Listen, you could be in a million different places, uh, but I think you're in the right spot. My, my hope is and my prayer is for you today uh, that you will leave this experience uh, encouraged, uh, challenged, motivated to take your next step with your heavenly father. That, that is my hope today. But if that's gonna happen, um, you, you gotta have an open heart to it. You have to want that. You've gotta ask God for that in your life. Uh, so you guys ready to go? No, are, are, are you, 11 o'clock, 11.30, are you ready to go? Okay, man, you're killing me already up here. Uh, we're in a brand new series today. You ready for this? It's called Good News for Bad People. I got one person excited in the back. That's good. Good news uh, for bad people. Now, friend, tell me if this is true. Sometimes it's good news. Sometimes it's bad news. You, you tracking with me? I mean, you just get up. You don't know quite what the day is going to bring, right? Sometimes it's good news. Come on. And sometimes it's, it's bad news, right? But I'm going to tell you what the really good news. I'm going to just tell you the punchline right now. The really good news is that God can take really bad news and make it into really good things. Amen? Uh, that God can take really bad news things in our life, including when you're the one who's bad, and he can make it into something good. Amen? Uh, good news and bad news, and this is really good news for a whole bunch of us, because we need this in our life. Amen? And, and so uh, I, I heard a story this week. I just got to gotta tell you about it. It, it was uh, kind of funny. Uh, this guy goes to the doctor. He's got a lot of anxiety at this point. Like He thinks he is going to die. I mean, he's really, really concerned. He goes in uh, to the doctor and he says, Doc, I, I, I legit think I'm going to die because I hurt everywhere. And the doc goes, everywhere? He goes, oh yeah, everywhere I touch, I hurt. And he goes, like I touch my head and it hurts like crazy. I think I'm going to die. And the doc goes, really? That's crazy. And he goes, well, if I touch my arm, my elbow, I, I literally think I'm going to die. It hurts so bad. And if I touch my knee, it, it hurts. And and the doctor goes, I don't, everywhere? And he goes, yeah, if I touch my stomach, I, I feel like I'm going to die. You got to help me. You got to help me. And the doctor goes, okay, just calm down. Uh, I'm going to do a complete exam. We're going to figure this out. It'll be okay. And so the doc does whatever a doc does and, you know, says, oh, man, I got good news and I got bad news. And the guy says, well, what's, what's the good news? And, and the doc says, well, the good news is that you're, you're not going to die. The bad news is that you have a broken finger. Damn. People, this is not court. You can laugh. Come on. Oh, that was funny. Come on. Uh, sometimes it's good news and sometimes it's bad news. But the really good news is that God can take really bad news. If Jesus gets into the mix and make it into something really good. Uh, this is what we're gonna talk about today. I wanna get serious for the next few moments, very, very serious, and, and talk about this good news for bad people. And we're gonna start by praying, and then we're gonna jump into this. You ready to go? Okay. Father in heaven, uh, we just pause for a minute. I, I realize um, that for those in this space and those who are joining us online, uh, that we come from very different spots. And... Uh, we have different beliefs and different struggles and different doubts and different joys and all those sorts of things. But God, I do know that you want to speak to each of us no matter what. I, I'm convinced of this. Um, so God, we open our hearts. We open our minds to you. 
And we ask, God, that you'd help us to dial in and hear from you. So we say it like this, speak, O oh God, for your child is listening. Amen? Amen. Now, there is a word in, in the Bible that you're probably familiar with, especially if you grew up around uh, church life. It's a Greek word. Uh, it's used uh, a little under a hundred times, mostly or pretty much exclusively in the New Testament part of the Bible, and it is the word called gospel. Have you, have you heard this word before? Anybody? The gospel? Uh, it, it, it's a Greek expression. Phonetically, it goes something like this. Euangelion. Euangelion. We just say gospel. Uh, but the, the meaning of this word is literally translated. You ready for this? It's literally translated God's good news. God's good news. Uh, we're in a series called God's good news for bad people. Good news for bad people. Now, now listen, uh, the, have you grown up, anybody old school church people around here? Yeah. Anybody old school? Uh, you grew up around the gospel, right? This is a phrase that if you're in church life long enough, even you young people, uh, you're going to hear it. Uh, the word gospel, you, you hear it like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you heard this before? Uh, or you heard some preacher guy say, oh, the gospel is so beautiful. The gospel is awesome, right? Uh, you might hear somebody say uh, this, like, hey, turn to the gospel according to Mark. Have you heard this before? The gospel according to Matthew, right? Uh, so there's a whole genre of music. I don't know if you know this called gospel music, right? There's black gospel, uh, there's southern gospel, there's plain old white people gospel, right? Um, and what's weird about all of these different genres of gospel music is they're hard to define sonically, musically, stylistically all the time, but you know it when you hear it, right? There's just something about it that you know it when you hear it. It's different, right? Uh, so think about this. The, the gospel, we, we, uh, we often call the first four books of the New Testament part of the Bible called the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, and John, right? And the reason that we call them the Gospels is because it means the good news about Jesus Christ. God's good news, listen, through Jesus Christ. You hearing me? Anybody in the room? You hearing me? It is the, God, the good news that God wants to bring. And so we're gonna go old school today, if it's okay with you. We're gonna do old school Bible study hour. Are you with me? We're going to go old, okay? Uh, and, um, and, and we're going to talk about this word gospel because everything that we believe as Christians, that I believe as a Christian, uh, this book that we talk about all the time, from the first page to the last page, every bit of it points to the gospel, God's good news. Uh, and, and my hope is, is that we will come to realize that when we put Jesus in the middle of the mix, if Jesus gets involved in whatever situation, it can take really bad news and make it into really good news. And it can take even those of us who are, who are the problem, really good news for bad people. And sometimes you are the bad person. Sometimes, listen, let's just, you, you wanna do good, amen? Anybody? Anybody? You wanna think good, uh, you wanna be good. But can we just be honest? We're not always good, right? We don't always think good. We don't always do good things. And we're not always good. And the gospel is that if we get Jesus into the middle of it, it's really good news for bad people. That's what we're going to talk about today. And so uh, I thought we'd take some time to make sure that we are crystal clear on what this church is about. Um, I want us to be crystal clear because we can become about a whole bunch of really good things, but there's only one thing that we're really all about. Uh, and we're going to make it crystal clear, not just for people who lived 2,000 years ago, not just for us old school church people who've been around for a little bit, but for right here, right now, in this generation, my hope is, is that we will walk out of this series knowing that God is still in the business of bringing good news to a very broken and bad world. Amen? Y'all with me so far? Come on, y'all ready? So we're gonna go old school uh, Bible hour. And uh, my hope is, is that you will be willing to go with me on this, that you'll turn to your phone. I want you, I'm giving you permission uh, to turn to your Bible or to your smartphone. And I want you to do me a favor. Uh, and now I want you to, up on screen, I'm gonna put this phrase. It's Ephesians 2 NLT. I want you to just put that into your browser, just like it's spelled here. Ephesians 2 uh, NLT. Put that in your browser and a miracle will happen. It'll come up 
And the very top thing, just click on it. And it'll bring you to the exact text that we are going to read together. Now, look, look at me. For, I know you're busy, but, but listen. Some of y'all are going, well, I'm not much of a Bible person. Oh, this is perfect for you because I want to teach you the Bible. And, and I want us to do this together. Listen, I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to see it yourself. And I know you have a phone. Get it out. Come on, get it out and dial up Ephesians chapter two. This is old school Bible study hour, okay? Y'all aren't with me so far. Okay, this is good. Okay, y'all with me? Come on. Now, listen to me. Uh, the message contained in Ephesians chapter two, I want you to hear me on this. It is probably the best explanation of the Christian faith. You hear me? This is big. So for those who are church people, Jesus people, uh, this is going to help us to understand what we really believe. And if you're not like a church guy, if you're not into church life, because it's kind of weird, I get it, it's kind of weird, um, but it's a good kind of weird. Uh, this is going to help you to understand if you're curious, even just curious about what the message of Jesus is, about what the message of the gospel is, what God's good news is really all about. My hope is, if you hang with me through this series, this will explain it. But this text is the very heart of what we believe. So you ready for this? Anybody? Yeah. All right. Um, here we go. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Okay, I'm going to give you uh, something that I don't normally do because I think it's normally very cheesy. And I think it's a terrible way to teach. Uh, but I can't think of a better idea. So we're going to go old school. Like back in the 80s, preachers and teachers would always use these acrostics. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Acrostic is where you give a word and then each of the letters in the word give you like kind of a defining part of that word. Have you seen this? Very, I hate it. I hate it. I hate teaching like this. I can't think of a better idea. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to use an acrostic for the word gospel. G-O-S-P-E-L. And... Uh, and I'm going to kind of fill it in as we go. Um, and I want you to know that this isn't an original idea. There's all kinds of people who have used this before. Uh, but if it's okay with you, I'm just going to put the Pastor Jay twist on it. Is that cool? Y'all good with this? Okay, so uh, let's start by reading Ephesians 2 together, okay? It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Pause. I'm not going to pause all the way through this, but I got to tell you this right now. <laughs> it doesn't say you were dead because of your one sin. Is anybody really good at sinning in the room or is it just me? I would think that this kind of applies to all of us. It's not one thing, it's many things in our life that separates us from God. Am I right about this? I mean, it's not, you don't just have one hang up, you got a bunch of hang ups. And if you don't think you're a hang up, ask the lady that you came with. She'll tell you. You got some hangups, all right? So listen to this. It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. So we're no different. Just because you're in church, it doesn't make you better than anybody else. People on the outside look at church people and they go, oh, you think we're, you're so holy and better than everybody else? That is not the case. I don't know what they're talking about. I understand who I am on the inside and so do you. So do you. Matter of fact, this is a mission, an admission of our guilt, right? It says this, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's wrath. One translation says, because of what you have done and because of who you are, you are subject to God's wrath. And you go, well, that seems a little bit harsh. Now listen, anybody have a two-year-old? Anybody? Do you have to uh, teach a two-year-old how to be disrespectful and disobedient? How to be selfish? Anybody at all? No, you have to teach them the exact opposite, right? Because there's a nature inside of us that is rebellious, Amen. Yeah, okay, now listen what it says. It says, but here it is, verse four. But God is so rich in his mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were, what is this word? Dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we were raised, uh, when, when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Woo, okay? For he raised us from the dead along with Christ. He breathed life into us because he breathed life into Jesus, the Son of God, when he was crucified. He breathed life back into him and he 
is raised from the dead. And because of that, God breathes life into you today. You're raised from the spiritual dead, the slumber that we live in. He says this, he says this, uh, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future generations as examples of his incredible wealth and grace and kindness toward us uh, as he has shown all he has done for us who are united with Christ. Amen. Verse eight, uh, God saved you by what? Grace, grace by his grace. Uh, when you believe others, uh, other translations say you are saved by faith and faith alone. Anybody with me so far? Uh, it says this, and you can't take credit for this. It's not that you've done this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done or we have done. So none of us can boast about it for we are God's masterpiece for he, uh, he created us a new in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Yeah. The core truths of the, of the gospel. I want to go through six of them. Six core truths. And the first one begins with this letter G. G begins the word gospel. The acrostic begins with this letter G. And it stands for God's character. God's character. God's nature. You see, the gospel begins and ends with God. It does not begin and end with you. We are not the center of the story of God. We are not the center of the story of humanity. We are not the center of the story of creation. Who is the center of the story? God is. It begins and it ends uh, with God. It begins and ends with who he is. And, and what's interesting is we see the nature of God on display in this one little passage. Do you remember the first few verses we, we read? It was all about the trouble we're in. You're dead, right? It talks about the, the wrath of God's coming. The anger of God is coming. The judgment of God, the justice of God. All of that is in there, right? You see that in there, right? You see it all. But it all changes on verse four. You ready for this? Say ready. ready. This is possibly one of the best verses in the whole doggone Bible. Right here. This all changes. It all shifts right here. This is how the gospel is imparted to us. You ready for this? Verse four, it says, but God. I, I honestly fully expected a little bit more, but people online were like typing or something. They, they were excited. Everything shifts with this little phrase. But God, you were dead. But God, you were in trouble. Come on. But God, uh, but God in his mercy. But God in his mercy. And you gotta love this, but God. Well, well life is so broken. Yeah, yeah, I know. But God. Life is so full of disappointment. I know. But God, uh, life is so far, uh, so full of difficulties and hurt. I, I know. But, but God, uh, listen, I have screwed up so much of life already. I know. But, come on. But God, anybody in the house need to hear that today? Um, this is the message of the gospel. And the message of, of the gospel does not depend on you. It does not depend on what you've done or who you are and how you come into this place, what your past is. The message of the gospel does not depend on you at all. It depends on God and what he has done for you. Uh, look at this passage. It says uh, that you were dead, but because of his great love, it says God made you alive, amen, together with Christ. Where, where are you made alive? Come on. With Christ. Right, with Christ, right? Listen to this verse. It's uh, verse six, I think it is. It says, God raises us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable, immeasurable riches of his grace. Let me tell you something, people. That is an upgrade. You're moving seats. You're hanging out here in some seats in Taylor, Michigan, but it ain't here for all of eternity, people. It's there. And let me tell you something. There is better than here. Here's not bad, but there is really good. Right? You're getting an upgrade. Listen to this. It says, uh, who is doing this action? Who is doing the saving? Do you save yourself? Listen, do you fix yourself? Let me tell you something. Let me look at me. If you could have fixed you, you would have fixed you a long time ago, but you're still you. And you're still struggling. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't know what it is, but there's something in you that you've wanted to fix for a long, long time. Change for a long, long time. 
and you tried a hundred different ways. If you could fix you, you would have fixed you. But you can't fix you. It takes God. If you look at this, the way we get into this picture is completely passive. God is the active voice and we are the passive receiver. It says this, that you have been saved. You, did you catch that in there? It says you have been what? Saved. Who did the saving? You or God? God. It's totally passive on your account, right? Uh, you can't save yourself. Uh, Paul goes on and later writes this. He says, it is by grace that you have been saved. This has been done to you. The giver of God's grace is God, not you. You don't give grace like, I know I just screwed it up. I'm gonna just let myself go on this one. No, it is God who makes you better. It is God who gives grace, amen? Come on, somebody, amen? And so you see on display here, you see the holiness of God and the justice of God you see the wrath of God and you see the mercy of God. This is all of God's character all wrapped up into one passage. You see his hatred toward evil, but his love toward evildoers. You see this? You see his hatred toward sin, but his love toward sinners. It's all wrapped up. And if we're going to understand the gospel, we have to understand the full nature of God and not just take one part of the nature. We have to understand the whole picture of God. And what this means is that so many people come to God because they think they will get something from God, like the stuff of life. And this is so much part of culture, right? That if I just come to God, God's going to bless me. He's going to make my life better in a million different ways. I'm going to get healthy, wealthy, and I'm going to get that big set of hair I've been dreaming about, right? Uh, and this is the culture of America. Uh, this is the culture of the world. The, this is the culture of so much of the Christian state in the world right now. Like we're, we're talking all across America, Asia, Africa. Listen, when I was in Central America a couple years ago, uh, when I was in Africa a couple years ago, I'm telling you, man, uh, the biggest churches we saw uh, were these pros, you know, prosperous churches, really wealthy. I'm like, in Africa? I mean, look at this. It's like a shrine. Oh, you know, and, 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 they were, and they were filled. Listen to me. They were filled with some of the poorest people on planet earth who had some shyster of a pastor in front of them saying, if you just give, if you just empty your wallets out to God, God will bless you like he blessed me. Friends, that is a lie. That is not the truth of the gospel. That's not the gospel at all. At all. Because listen, we say it like this. We say it like this. We don't say come to God to get stuff. We say come to God to get God. Hello, anybody with me on this? Come to God to get God. That's why we come to him. He is the center of it all. He is the reward. He, the creator cannot be exchanged for created things because you can spend your whole life, we've talked about this over and over, you can spend your whole entire life trying to fill it with every part of creation. But if you miss the creator, I guarantee you, your soul will be shallow. Your soul will be empty. And you'll be in need. So the nature of God is that he is both just and merciful. That he is both good and gracious. That he is both demanding. He is the judge. But he loves us like crazy. And he gives us grace. So the very first part of the gospel is to understand who God is. He is the reward that we seek. Amen. You with me? Anybody with me at all? You with me? So here's the number two. Here's the O. O, acrostic, O, says, the, write down, take a picture, the offense of sin. Do you realize that there is an offense called sin? We don't want to talk much about sin in our world today, but the book of Ephesians chapter two, it describes the state of humanity in a very real way. And I think it's dead on accurate, right? What did it say? It says, you used to live in this thing called sin, just like the rest of the world. Pause. Has anybody glanced at the news? Anybody at all? Is this world not messed up? Any, or is it just me? Like, right? I mean, it's everywhere in our world. It's everywhere. The brokenness of humanity is literally everywhere. And, and let me tell you something. It says this. You used to live that way, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. There is this spirit of disobedience at work not only in the world, but it is at work in you, unless it changes. But we think, I'm awesome. The world tells me I'm awesome. 
Is this not the message of the world right now? You're awesome just the way you are. Don't change anything. Don't regret anything. Don't, don't move forward at all. Just You just be you. You just be the best version of you. Listen, if I got more of me, you'd all be in trouble. You wouldn't like it. This world needs less of me and more of Jesus, right? And you need less of you and more of Jesus. This is the exact opposite message that the world gives. How, how's your marriage gonna go if it just all becomes more and more about you and what you want, you desire, and how you doing, right? I guarantee you it's a disaster waiting to happen. Friendships, parents, children, how are your relationship's gonna go if it's all about you? I'm awesome. My mama raised me and told me I was awesome all my life. My teachers told me I was awesome. The guys all thought I was awesome. The gals, the girls, they all thought I was awesome. You ain't awesome. You're dead. I don't mean to be offensive, but you're dead inside. You take all the awesomeness you've ever piled up, and I guarantee you on the flip side of that scale is a shallowness of soul and a brokenness of heart that you know is deep inside of you. Every single one of us, every single one of us has bro brokenness. This world is desperately broken. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Um, you see, the problem isn't just sin. Uh, the problem is that you are dead because of your sin. You, that I'm lifeless and I'm living and breathing and paying taxes and working hard, but I'm like a zombie walking around until God makes me alive. There's a shallowness of soul because of all the beauty that was God planted in us has been destroyed by this thing called sin. Uh, the Bible says it like this. You ready for this? Say ready. Okay, you've given me permission now. It says this. It says for all of us, every one of us have sinned and we've fallen short of God's standard. Every one of us. So I thought we would do something pretty cool today. Uh, I'm going to take a minute or two and I'm just going to let whoever in the room uh, feels that that doesn't apply to them, uh, just explain why. We'll go ahead and wait. Go ahead. Anybody got it going on so good that God's going to look at you and go, whoa, we might need to trade places. Right? Anybody at all? No. It says all of us have sinned. Every one of us. Uh, every one of us have turned away from God. All of us. You, me, we've lied. We cheated. We're deceitful. Uh, we're angry. We're hostile. We're hurtful toward other people. Uh, we're self-absorbed. Uh, we've lusted. We're full of greed. We got anger toward people for no reason at all. We got bitterness. Any, does this ring a bell to anybody? This fills the human heart. And the result is a broken world. A broken sexuality. Broken marriages. Broken families. Broken governments. Broken businesses. Broken people. Everywhere. Everywhere in our world. You see, my problem is not that it's not just going my way. My problem is not like, oh, I've screwed up a couple things. I could do a little bit better. That's not my problem. My problem is that I'm dead. The problem is that my soul is lifeless without God. And I will be dead for all of eternity if something doesn't change. Amen? And I don't mean just like sort of dead, like, hey, you're a pretty good guy. No, I'm dead. Like we're talking dead cat on the side of the road dead. That's what we're talking. Like that level dead, right? That's a joke, people. Man. Um, I want to say something. Do you, do you think it's easy for me uh, to have to come up here and say this to such a great group of people? Do you, do you think it's easy for me to come here and say, our world is messed up and jacked up and screwed up and need in, in desperate need of a savior? You think that's easy? No, I'll tell you, it's not easy. I'm terrified to get up here and say this kind of stuff. Because I know what some of you are going to think. You're going to think, oh, he thinks he's holier than thou. He thinks he's better than me. He th you know, that church is so judgmental. That guy is so judgmental. I'll tell you, it couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. I don't think any of that. You don't need me to remind you, am I right? You don't need a preacher to remind you that this world is messed up and jacked up and screwed up and in desperate need of a savior. Amen? But maybe, maybe you need me to remind you, though, that you're messed up not just the world, that you're jacked up, not just the world, that you're in need of a savior and I'm in need of a savior, not just the world. Amen? You see, our sin is a great offense toward a holy and righteous God. Do you know that God says, be perfect because I am perfect? How, how, how are you doing? 
Not so good. Not so good. Um, you see, we get all offended. The reason that preachers and churches don't want to say anything about sin is because they're afraid their people are going to get offended. And some of you guys are going to get offended and you're not going to come back. And there's preachers and churches that are afraid that people aren't going to come back. Um, but frankly, you know who's offended? You know who should be offended? God should be offended. God should be offended by our sin. Well, God's a little uptight. Well, listen, you didn't make God. God made you. And God has the right to tell the created thing how to behave and who to be and what to trust and what to look toward in life. God has every right to put his finger down on you and say, knock it off, right? He says to you and to me, be holy, therefore, because I am holy. But friends, listen, uh, we get all bent out of shape thinking God's being unreasonable. God's being unreasonable. He, why is he getting so mad about this thing called sin? I'll tell you why. It's because we have a me-centered, a human-centered gospel. We have a human-centered understanding of this thing called sin and grace. Because listen, God takes sin very, very seriously. I was thinking about this. Uh, Genesis 15, there is a story. Maybe you're familiar. It's, uh, it's a story of a guy named Lot and his wife and his family, and how God was going to destroy a city or two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. Anybody remember this? And God says, because of their wickedness, because of their sin, I'm going to destroy them. Boom, boom, you know, blows up. And God says, I'm going to spare Lot and his wife and his children. And he says, but here's the deal. When you leave the city, I'm going to give you time to leave the city before I destroy it. But listen to this. He says, one thing, do not, listen to me, do not turn back to your old life. Do not look back. Do not go back. Do not long for it. Do not want it because I'm a God who moves forward, not backwards. You hear me? And so God tells this to them. And Lot's like, thank you very much. I'm doing exactly what you're saying. But his wife was like, hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then the fireworks all start. I don't know what happened, but the city goes, blows up. And she does what? Turns around. And looks at it. And the Bible says that she's instantly uh, petrified. She's turned into this pillar of salt and dies right there on the spot. And people hear this and go, that's just so mean. Like, who doesn't like fireworks? I would turn around and look at the fireworks too. But you're not God. She did not die because she turned around and looked at the fireworks. She died because she disobeyed the God of heaven and earth. That's why she passed. Because she thought she knew something better than God. We would never do that. Holy smokes. Uh, there's this story. I think it's uh, 1 Samuel 6. I think. Uh, there's this guy named Yuza. And uh, he is transporting the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, it's that one, okay? Uh, so the, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant was this place where God's Spirit resides. Now he resides with us. The Holy Spirit is given to you when you believe. Amen? Somebody in the house? Come on. Amen? The Holy Spirit. But back in the day, it says the Holy Spirit made his presence known in this place called the Ark of the Covenant. And so they had these sticks, these poles, and they would pole bear the, the Ark of the Covenant to transport wherever God led Moses to take the people. And God says, it is a great honor for you to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And it would be a great honor. Wouldn't it? It's like when somebody passes and they ask you to be a pole bearer? That's a great honor, right? And so they, they lift it up, but God says, listen, here's the deal. You will have the honor of transporting the Ark of the Covenant, but do not touch it. It's holy, and you are not. It is separate, and you are not. Don't touch it, no matter what. Don't touch it. So they're going down the road, like, we're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. It's so sweet, Right? And they hit a Michigan pothole, right? And what happens? It says that they hit a ravine and it says the ark begins to tumble. And Uzzah thought he was doing God a favor. And he reaches up and he pushes it back. And he dies instantly. And people go, what? He was just trying to help God out. Why would God be so uptight about this? Pause for a second. Do you think God needs your help? What does God want from you? Help or obedience? Obedience. Obedience. You and I, we want help. Our little guy comes along and helps us. We're like, hey, thanks for the help. But God wants our obedience. He died because of, not because he helped God. It's because he disobeyed God. And we go, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. God's a lot nicer now. Well, God hasn't loosened up on sin at all. Do you guys remember the story of uh, Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts? Anybody remember? They come to church. 
They give their offering, but they lie about their offering. They're like, yeah, we're totally into the church. We're totally into God. Here's our money. We, we're so generous. And it found out that they gave $1.45 last year. I made that number up. Some of y'all go, I'm so into church. I love it. I'm so grateful. I'm so blessed. And you give $1.45. And it was a lie before God. It was a lie. And God struck them dead. They came into church, each one separately. And God took their life right there. Boom, fell down in church, dead. I hope God doesn't do that among us. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And people go, why is God so upset about this? It's because you and I have an opinion about sin that is very man-centered because we're sinners. God is perfect. He is totally different between us, right? Now listen, um, if you sin against a rock, listen to me, it's no big deal. It's a rock. You sin against your puppy dog, you're a jerk. But you're not guilty of much, right? You sin against me, I may not like you very much, but I'm not gonna kill you, right? You lie to me, I'm not gonna like kill you. You steal from me, I'm not gonna like kill you. Am I right? But you steal and you lie and you sin against a holy and righteous God, an infinitely glorious God. You have sinned in an infinitely unholy way. I don't know if you realize this. You sin against me, it's no big deal. You sin against somebody else, it's no big deal. But there's a big difference between me and God, amen? And there's a big difference between you and God. And God says, I want you to be holy. So sin is this great offense to, toward God. And uh, this leads us uh, to the next le letter. Uh, you see, our sin separates us from God. It's the nature of God is holy and good and just and righteous and all this. And our sin is a great offense and it separates us from God. And that leads us to the next letter and it's sufficiency of Jesus. Yeah, pastor. Oh. I love that word sufficiency. It's such an awesome, I don't even know what it is, but it's awesome, right? Sufficiency means that God is enough for you that God does what you cannot do. He is sufficient to pay the check. We might owe a million dollars, but if you don't got a million dollars, you can't pay the bill. You may want to pay the bill, but you can't. And Jesus is sufficient to pay the bill. God is holy. We've offended him. Uh, we've sinned against God and, and uh, he is just. And, and it is God's duty because he is holy. Listen, because he is just, because he is good, it is God's duty to punish sin. Amen? We don't want a God who just goes, ah, no big deal. We want a God who is righteous and holy and does his job and looks at the sin of the world and says, I ain't gonna tolerate that. That means you and I are in the middle of that sin in the world because you and I are sinners. We already established that. None of us are righteous. No, not even one, right? And so you feel the tension here. Um, how can God be just and merciful at the same time towards sinners like us? How is that possible? Uh, that's the ultimate question of the Bible. But people think, no, 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 that's not that big of a deal. Like, I don't know anybody who is like staying up late at night, can't go to sleep because they are just so worried about the kindness of God. Most people that I know who've gotten ticked off at me as a preacher have said just the opposite. They go, I can't figure out one thing about your Christian faith. How could a good and loving God send people to hell? How can a good and loving God send good people to hell? We already established there is no one who is good, not, only, not even one. And so the question of the Bible is absolutely different than that. You know what the big question that this entire book answers? You ready for this? It's the exact opposite of what you think. It is the question of the Bible is, God, how can you be just and holy and let rebels like me into heaven? That is the question of the Bible. Because listen, if God let me into heaven, it would suck for you. And some of you are more screwed up than I am. If you and I could go to heaven the way we are with all the sin and the, and the junk and the stuff that we drag through life, the bitterness and the anger and the greed and the lust and all that kind of stuff, would heaven look more like heaven or would heaven look more like earth? It would be like earth. And I don't plan on spending eternity in this place, pal. You know what I'm talking about? With God, it better be different, amen? It better be other than this place. And God says it will be 
because I am different and I demand something different to get here. And so the big question is, is in the Bible is, God, how can you be both just and holy and all that kind of stuff and let rebels like me get in to heaven? Let me tell you something. God cannot turn a blind eye towards sin. That'd be like saying that we have a judge. Let's say there's a judge in, in our American culture and uh, some guy comes before him. He's accused of murdering 10 children. Uh, this was completely videoed. Like everybody saw it, cold-blooded murder, 10 children, and 30 of you witnessed it live in the room. Uh, okay, you all with me so far? Like this guy is guilty, right? This would be like God turning a blind eye to our sin would be like a, a judge going, yeah, I saw the video. Wow, that was rough. Huh, you're innocent. Have a good life. You're free to go. What would you say as a, as a citizen of this country? You would say, forget that. That guy deserves to go to jail, right? Or he deserves to be punished, right? And that judge has to go. Well, friends, listen, God is the same way. It is his job to make sure that justice is served in this world. How can God express his holy justice without condemning us? How, how, listen, how can God express his holy love without condoning our sin? How can he do this? You ready? Come on, you ready? His name is Jesus. Come on, come on, you're not hearing me. His name is Jesus. The answer is found in the sufficiency of Christ. For God, there's a passage that says, for God so loved the world that he didn't want you separated but that he gave his one and only son to come to this world. I call that Merry Christmas. We just celebrated Christmas, right? We do not shrink back as Christians. We do not shrink back from saying Jesus is the son of God made flesh, came to make his dwelling among us. Amen? Amen. Merry Christmas to you, right? Um, I heard a pastor, a guy named David Platt. He's super, super good guy. Not as good as me, but he's a good guy. Um, he, he tells the story of being in the Middle East on a mission trip to share uh, the message of Jesus with Muslim people during their holy month of Ramadan. And he says, I was nervous about this. Like I was, and you would feel the same way, right? He says, I was nervous. And he said he found himself uh, in a group of Muslim men uh, sharing about how God so loved the world that he came to be with us. And he began to describe about how God reaches out to us and calls toward us. And it's through the person of Jesus. And he says he's in the middle of explaining the Christian uh, message, right? The, the gospel. And this Muslim guy very aggressively says, that's not true. That's not true. That is impossible. And, and, and David's like, whoa, what's, why? What's, what, what's wrong? Let me finish. And, and the guy says, no. God would never, he said, quote, debase himself like that. God would never lower her, himself like that to become like one of us, to become a mere man. You do not know the greatness of God. Our God, this guy, Muslim guy is saying, is too great for that. And David's response was great. He says, well, I agree that God is powerful. I agree God is great that God is greater than us and that God is greatness. That is the exact epitome of greatness. But he goes, but can I explain? And the guy says, yeah, I do not understand. And, and David says, well, let me tell you a story. He says, let me tell you a story. He says, um, so this guy, and he starts to fall in love with this girl. He spent some time with this girl and really something is fired up in his heart a little bit and it just goes deeper and deeper and it gets past the facade and he realizes that he wants to spend a lifetime with this woman and to build a family together and to have kids and to build a life. And, and uh, so he says, so this guy falls in love with this girl. Would this guy who decides to, in America, he explains that we do a wedding proposal. And the Muslim goes, oh, we do that too. We do that too. And he goes, well, would that guy send his buddy over to his girl to make this proposal, to let her know the good news that he wants to spend a lifetime with her. And the guy goes, no, who would do that? That's crazy. No, the man would go himself. And he goes, well, that was me. I fell in love with my wife and I didn't send my friend and I didn't send my buddy, but I went and I told her the news myself. And he says, this is the story of the Christian faith, that God so loved the world that he did not send 
a preacher, a pastor, a missionary, or even a great prophet, referring to Muhammad, right? He says, did not even send a prophet to deliver this news that God wants to reconcile with you. He loved you so much. He came and told you himself. You see, yeah, he came and told you himself that he is the one to put your hope in, to trust in. And so over the years, a lot of people have said to me, like, Jeremy, you know, as a preacher, I respect what you're trying to do, but all pathways lead to God. Have you heard this before? Like, they, they give this analogy. This is like, people have tried to convince me of this over and over through the years. They say, God is like this mountain, right? Or maybe he's on top of the mountain. And you might be on this side and you might be over here and this people group's over here and this people group's here. And, but there are all these different pathways up the mountain. And, and all of them are gonna get to God eventually. You may call the God different. You may name him differently. And your ways might be a little bit different than the other guy's ways. But we're all heading in the same direction. And when I hear that, I go, no, 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 no. Stop right there. Hold on one second, one second. You don't understand a single thing about the Christian faith then. Because our God does not stay up on the mountain. Our God does not stay up there going, oh, I hope those people find the way eventually. Our, our, our God does not go up there and go, oh, those people are screwed up. I hope they find the right pathway. Our God comes off the mountain and comes down to you and to me and calls out to us and reaches into our heart and to our soul and our mind and says, I love you and I want a relationship with you. He was not content with staying there. He came here. And that is the message of the gospel is that he is sufficient. And so Jesus comes and he lives a life that, that, that you and I are, were not able to live. Tempted by sin, like you and I are tempted, but never, uh, uh, never had sin triumph over him. He was sinless and perfectly obedient to his Father in heaven and willingly gave up his life to pay for our sin as the sacrifice to make it right, to pay the due penalty of what is owed to God because of our sin. So people go, well, how, uh, how can we see the justice and the holiness of God on display? I say, look to the cross. Look to the Christ hanging on the cross. That is the wrath of God coming down on the sin of the world. Who among us would sacrifice his own son? No one would. But God does. Because the price of sin has to be paid. And he does not want you to pay that bill. He knows you cannot pay the bill because you are not sufficient to pay the bill. How can the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God be seen? I say the same thing to you. Look to the cross. Look to the cross because on the cross, the wrath of God and the mercy of God, the, the judgment of God and the love of God, uh, the, the holiness of God and the grace of God are all on display because of Jesus. And it says that you and I have a problem. And the problem is more than just a sin problem. The problem is that we're dead. And it says that we are made alive in Christ Jesus. Amen? That he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The gospel begins with God's character, his nature, holy and just, loving and graceful. And sin is a great offense before God. And let me tell you something, it is so deep and you are in such trouble because of what goes on inside of your mind, inside of your soul, that you need a savior, that you can't fix it on your own. Look at the world. Could we fix it? No way. But Jesus is more than enough. He is sufficient to pay the bill that you could never pay. And he invites you into a relationship with our Heavenly Father through him. G-O-S. We're only halfway through, people. And the bad news is already starting to become good news, isn't it? Anybody? The bad news is starting to become good news. So I guess you got to come back next week for the full good news. Y'all good with that? Yeah. I just think it'd be important that we end our time together humbly before God. Uh, nobody get out of this room. Just let me pray us out. Um, I, I want to pray for you. I want to lead you in a prayer um, between you and God. Just bow your head. I don't, I don't know what you believe. I don't know where you're at. But would you just bow before God for a moment? 
Maybe you would say, Heavenly Father, I'm, I'm really glad to be here today. I needed to hear this. Maybe you would just say, God, I confess my sin before you. I confess my lack of holiness before you. I want to be different. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to be holy, but I, I, I have trouble. It's like two steps forward, two steps back half the time. And just say to God, I am so sorry. And I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I don't want this sin to keep me dead. Maybe, maybe you would just say, Jesus, I want to come alive. And I want you to forgive me. God, literally just say to God. I mean, if you, if you, you, it's between you and God. I don't know what's going on in your heart, but you would just say, God, I'm asking for your grace. I'm asking for your forgiveness. I accept it. I need it. Help me to walk inside of that. I invite your spirit to take control of my life. Be Lord over me. Help me to walk with you. Help me, God. Help me. In Jesus' name, together we say, Amen.